in Chandigarh. I welcome you all to this event. And I am delighted to introduce to you today our special guest for the evening, the award-winning Canadian journalist, Professor Nanava Dhanran. In conversation with Ms. Duncan today is another distinguished journalist who needs no introduction at this gathering, Ms. Nanki Hans, Chief News Editor of the prestigious Tribune. <laughs> All through the evening, I encourage you to post about today's event on your social media posts by tagging us at Canada in India. Before uh, we start the conversation, I would like to request our Acting Consul General, Mr. Francois Rupin, to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very delighted to be here with you all today. I'm especially happy to be representing the Consul General of Canada at this event, which brings together an award-winning Canadian journalist and professor, Ms. Nana Abadamkin, for a conversation with a distinguished Indian journalist, Ms. Nan Nanki Hans. Kala is proud to partner with the prestigious newspaper, The Tribune, for to facilitate this dialogue. I think such dialogues are important, as they help in the exchange of best practices in journalism and in enriching the media landscapes of our respective countries. I don't need to emphasize this in an audience of members of the media, but the fact remains that a free and vibrant media can help promote equality, inclusion, and the rule of law. However, a robust media is also a media that challenges itself and always strives to be and to do better. And one area where there remains room for improvement in the industry worldwide is in bringing diversity to the table especially when it comes to gender equality. Last year, a survey by the Canadian Association of Journalists found that almost 77% of newsrooms in Canada have no visible minority or indigenous person in a high-level high leadership role. And in India, according to a joint report by News Laundry and Oxfam released in 2022, none of the mainstream media organizations have people belonging to scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in leadership roles. In addition, according to a recent report by the Reuters Institute, only 22% of the top editors across 242 uh, brands in the 12 largest markets worldwide are women, even though 40% of journalists in these markets are women. Equal representation of all groups in the media is important at both the practical and the symbolic level. Lack of diversity in organizations that report on day-to-day -day events can lead to an inadequate understanding of our most pressing issues and the inability to assess their impact on those affected. For example, global stories such as the pandemic or climate change pose unprecedented challenges for everyone. However, their impact on groups such as women or people belonging to the marginalized communities is compounded many times over over because of other systematic disadvantages they face. Which is why it is crucial to help empower women journalists along with those representing marginalized communities as equal partners in, sh in shaping a vibrant and free media. Canada is committed to the empowerment of women, including the empowerment of women journalists as equal partners in the media sector. More broadly, Canada's Feminist International Assistance Policy recognizes that supporting gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls is the best way to build a more peaceful, a more inclusive, and a more prosperous <coughs> world. Canada feels strongly that gender equality is not only a human rights issue, but an essential component of sustainable development, social justice, peace, and security. Because an inclusive, free, and vibrant media is an important constituent of healthy democracies. Canada is also committed to promoting media freedom and freedom of expression. At the international level, Canada co-hosted the first ever Global Conference for Media Freedom with the United Kingdom in 2019, and again with Botswana in 2020, to provide a platform for dialogues between journalists, 
civil society, and governments. Locally, we have partnered with numerous organizations and top editor level journalists in India, Nepal, and Bhutan to host capacity building workshops and forums for discussion on key issues such as misinformation, religious diversity, and data journalism. These activities have provided opportunities for media persons from across the subcontinent to exchange ideas on specific themes. And today's conversation with Professor Duncan is part of this continued collaboration and exchange. In closing, I'm confident that greater engagement between journalists in Canada and India will help strengthen our diversity, <coughs> strengthen and diversify the connections between our respective media sectors. And I look forward to an engaging and thought-provoking discussion today between Professor Duncan and Ms. Hans. So thank you, and uh, without further ado, I will uh, ask the, the mic to both our journalists. Thank you. So delighted to have you here. You are a broadcaster, podcaster, influencer, scholar. So many hats you wear. Wow. So where shall we start? Mm -hmm. What I understand is the focus of your work so far has been uh, inclusive journalism, non-binary journalism, and uh, racial journalism. So um, I would want to know at what point in your career did you realize uh, to make journalism more inclusive? Uh, in a very, I would want to know personally and experience if it triggered that kind of realization. So what exactly? When exactly, at what point of time did you realize that? Um, well, uh, first of all, I want to say hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. I appreciate um, you all coming, and I'm glad to be here. I would say that um, I started to think about inequality in journalism through my own experience. Uh, so I worked at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and I was a host at um, a show I was host on a show, uh, a national show, it was, uh, when I was working in the music department. And uh, this was sort of maybe three or four years in, and my, I'll say that my star was rising, we'll put it that way. And I put it that way because uh, I was getting more and more opportunities to host, um, host shows. And so there was one day when I was sitting in the kitchenette with my friend. Um, and I remember this moment because there was a moment where I froze and my hand was, I, I was at the, at the sink and my hand was inside, um, inside like a plastic container that I washed for my dishes. So what happened was, my friend and I were talking about how I was getting more opportunities to host. And he looked at me and he said, you know they're only giving this to you because you're a woman and you're black, right? And that stopped me in my tracks. You can imagine that when someone says something to you like that, as though I had no talent, do you think a national, a national broadcaster would allow someone like me to do her work if I wasn't good? No. But I didn't think that at the time. What happened at the time was that I felt bad and I was embarrassed and I didn't know what to say. And also I realized that I was really angry. And because I'm telling you this story now, I can tell you that it, it bothered me. It bothered me to be reduced to that. So the truth is, yes, I tick off boxes, but I'm also talented. And that's to me the most important thing. So what that did was, it said to me, when you say things like that or when you hear things like that at work, it makes you think that you're only there for those reasons, and then it makes you doubt yourself. It makes you doubt whether or not you're, you're, you're good enough to be there. And so I found myself, whenever I saw another person of color, um, specifically another black person, um, because there weren't that many, I would, you know, I would be attracted to them and I would meet them. And one thing I always did, especially with women as well, is I would always try to make sure that they were okay. Are you getting paid properly? Um, uh, how are you being treated at work? I just started to care about other people. And so that sort of snowballed. And um, I eventually became the 
co-chair of Diversify CBC, which is an, um, a, uh, an employee resource group or an affinity group or a buddy group um, at CBC for employees of color. Oops, sorry. So would you tell me more about this group? What exactly have you, yeah. what is the achievement? What exactly have you? So done? Diversify CBC is, um, it is an affinity group. It's an um, employee resource group. But I was working with, I was uh, leading it or co-leading it only uh, for two years. And I was the founding uh, co-chair. And what we did was, number one, it was a place for us to be together. That's the number one thing. Because so many of us were the only one in the room. And when you're the only one in the room, you get treated a certain way and you don't know where to put the feelings of, you know, of the things that happen to you. So um, we uh, came together to, uh, to socialize, but also we spoke out when uh, CBC was producing racist work. Um, and we ended up uh, creating uh, some documents to have uh, better anti-racist practices, editorial practices um, for content creators at CBC. Right. Uh, so, but what what is your your view has been your biggest achievement so far? My biggest achievement. Um, this is a difficult one because I feel like I'm supposed to say my children, um, which is true. But I also think that my biggest achievement is Media Girlfriends. Um, Media Girlfriends is uh, a podcast production company now, but it started in 2016 as a podcast. And at the time, I had started the podcast to, uh, to interview women who were working in journalism. And because the women I knew were women of color, there were women who never want children, women who were queer, it became this place that um, my industry could listen in and find out what is happening with women in journalism. and what, what are their lives like, what are their experiences like. So I would say that this Media Girlfriends is my greatest accomplishment because I wasn't expecting it to be anything. I wasn't expecting it to be anything. I just wanted to create a podcast and then it grew into a scholarship. We started um, giving out about $30,000 every, every year to different students who wanted to get into journalism. And then uh, we had some events and now it's a podcast production company. And really, in the beginning, it was just a vehicle for me to learn to get better um, at doing interviews. So the reason why I think it's a success for me is because it has grown far beyond what I could have imagined. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, uh, I mean, how, is, how inclusive is the Canadian media? How many women representatives in high positions and how many colored uh, racial people? Well, um, uh, we had Francois uh, mention the Canadian Association of Journalists. They had a, a diversity survey. And um, I think it was 77% are, what was it, 77%, uh, I forgot what that fact was or what that detail was. But what I can tell you are some other things that I learned, which is that the Canadian population, the Canadian um, population is like uh, about 50.6 and then 49, be 50.6% women. And in, journal, in, the, in this survey that was done, the survey was done with about 242 uh, newsrooms and over 5,000 journalists. And among them, it tracked. It, it was about 50.6% women. So it was, it's pretty on par. You have 50.6% women, you have 49% men, and then 0.4% uh, non-binary folks. And so what that means is that it's on par. But the women who are journalists are not holding these high positions. Rather, most of them are holding part-time positions or internship positions. And then um, when it comes to diversity, r racialized diversity, it's mostly among the women and then mostly um, in the part-time positions and the internship positions. So there are more men who are holding leadership positions. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I believe you have interviewed Me Too Movement founder. And uh, uh, how, do you, how do you assess the impact of this movement? Uh, yes, so uh, I interviewed Tarana Burke, 
and Tarana Burke is the founder of Hashtag Me Too. And um, as you all know, know, Me Too really blew up online and it blew up in many different industries. Um, it happened in the same way in Canada. But the, the incident or what really comes to mind when it comes to Me Too for Canada, for me, having worked at CBC, is the incident with Gian Gomeshi. So Gian Gomeshi uh, was, is a broadcaster, but when he was working at CBC, he was the host of this very big flagship art show, um, an art conversation show, a radio program, and it was huge. And then it came out that uh, there were a number of sexual assault cases um, against him. And honestly, I can say to you that some of us knew that there were some things happening. And this happens in many industries. There's always rumors, there's always something. And it was like that at CBC. And so one day he was working there and then the next day, I remember I went up to the floor because I worked on the same floor and he had pictures, large pictures of his face plastered across CBC and they were ripped off. And to me, it was, um, this might seem strange to say, but it, it had like, a, I remember the rip in his face as, as sort of, um, representing how quickly CBC reacted, but also just the nature of, this, of the topic. It, it felt so, um, so serious, and it is very serious. So I can say that for, the situ for me too, it was a time where a lot of people spoke up, and I'm glad that people spoke up. And in effect, some changes were made, but there's still so much work to do. Yeah, that's what I feel, that uh, these movements, they just come and go, but it's difficult to sustain. And, um, and after some time, they just disappear. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder whether such kind of uh, actually make a difference. Well, I mean, I think that a difference has been made we, in that we haven't forgotten Me Too yeah. and people remember it and some, I think in many industries, uh, including the journalism industry, uh, some policies were changed. And, but it does make me think of the movement for black lives. It does make me think of um, when George Floyd was murdered, how so many companies made promises and so many companies uh, had statements about their support for um, the, the black people who work at their, um, at their companies. And after that, some policies um, at a number of companies had changed and there were um, uh, initiatives around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then there were a number of people who were, a number of black people, racialized people who were moved up into certain positions. Um, suddenly people saw their leadership values and the leadership values that, or the leadership um, qualities that always existed. But I will say that um, I think some people have forgotten. I think some people are tired. Um, but there are those of us who won't forget because we can't. I, it's, I, I can't afford to forget. So really it's about long-term enforcing policies? Yeah, it is about those long-term enforcing poli policies, but sometimes those policies are made. They can be made, but are they, are they actually enforced? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, um, Manaba, you have uh, worked in various mediums. Uh, I was uh, wondering which you think is the best, podcast, broadcast, m newspaper journalism. Mm -hmm. I was wondering which you, which you think is the best or maybe the most important. Which is the best medium? The answer to that is it depends, really. Um, I'm, I love audio. Uh, I love creating audio. I like being on a mic. <laughs> but one of the reasons why I like audio is because it has, an it, has, it has an ability to go very, very far in a very easy way. Radio, as you all know, 
is so important in many communities. It's the same thing in Ghana, when I was working in Ghana there. Um, I, didn't, I don't know that I told you that I work in Ghana. It was one of my first journalism jobs. And radio is so important, particularly to rural communities and, and in villages, because that is where people get their information. It, that is where people get their information. So I really, really love audio. And so my love of audio has moved from radio to podcast. But I will say that um, right now, digital media is number one. And that, it, for me, it includes audio, but digital media is number one. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't mean that the others are, um, are not part of it. So you are with, you know, we're with yeah. the Tribune. But it, what it means to me is that um, I'm very, I have been very curious seeing how, how media outlets have adjusted to, to digital. The CBC is only now um, really deciding to move fully to digital. It takes it takes time. Yeah, I, here I would it takes like, time. Yeah, I agree. Here I would like to point out a few things about inclusivity. Um, we in in the Tribune, um, we we have seven departments which are right now headed by women. Uh, we have uh, bureau chiefs in Delhi. We have in Simla. We have in Chandigarh, Haryana. We have lifestyle section headed by a woman. We have a sister publications, uh, uh, Danik Tribune, that's the Hindi and, and Punjabi Tribune. And uh, both have news, the news editors are women. I myself got an opportunity. I was the first chief news editor. Congratulations. Thank you. And that's the glass ceiling. And, but I also credit that to my, my employees, really, the trust, because uh, I must say that India is a young and aspirational India now, and uh, though it's young and aspirational, but rooted, and there are changes being made. There are a lot of women coming into journalism, and yes, slow and steady, but they are also reaching the top positions. At least I've seen that for myself in my newspaper. It has happened, mm -hmm. and I know it is happening outside too. And. Uh, we have been very inclusive and it's not just about women. Uh, there was just a mention that there were, there were very few STs and SCs in the, in the news, uh, in, in, in the media. That is true, but uh, Tribune does have some, uh, a pretty good representation of them too. And it's always been a very modern and liberal and progressive paper. Since 1881, it, has, it was born in 1881. So it was always represented the voice of the people. It's been decades, it's been the voice of the people. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, uh, we already pursue decolonialized uh, journalism. Uh, why? Because it was, it, was, uh, it was born in 1881 when many English newspapers were not there. And in the region, we, we were the voice of the people. We spoke about against the colonial rule and in the policies, which were not to the benefit of our people. And, uh, and in that sense, it, it, had, it has gone through turbulent times. Uh, we've had horrible, horrible traumatic partition. And, then, and that is the time this, our paper shifted here to, to this part of Punjab. And then we have seen wars, we have seen emergency, militancy. It has gone through a lot. And, in, 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 and uh, I, I personally, I, I feel that Tribune is a very progressive paper in that sense. And it has held on to the voice. And we have been uh, giving voice to unrepresented or underrepresented groups. Not only through our selection of news, we have been fair and fearless, rather we've been fearlessly fair. I would say that this is good. Something that I have learned um, having come here um, is uh, I've been reading the, the uh, report on gender in newsrooms in Ghana that was in, in, in India that was done um, by uh, partnership with News Laundry and, and the UN. And it would seem that the Tribune would be um, on the more progressive side uh, because typically it seems as though um, it appears that uh, there are there are women in in newsrooms, but it is not a high number, 
and that one of the major issues for women in newsrooms is sexual harassment. And I really think that it's important to talk about that and to bring it up. And they make a, they make a good point, or they make a, a very strong point of bringing it up because having to deal with sexual harassment at your workplace is not something that should happen. Having to deal with sexual harassment when you're just looking at wanting a job or keeping your job is not how things should be. And so some of the changes that need to happen um, in Canadian newsrooms and in Indian newsrooms is that there should just be no, there should be no tolerance for sexism. And the way that happens, I think, is that when we're having conversations, editorial conversations, or when we are together in the newsroom, that we don't have those jokes. We just don't even allow the jokes, right? Because that's where the thinking begins. We don't allow the jokes. We don't allow the comments. And we also make sure that the sexism doesn't bleed through when we are writing our stories. And the reason for that is so that you let the people in your newsroom know that this is not acceptable. It means that anything that goes farther than that is also not acceptable. That's all right. It's there and then. Yeah, we, I mean, that has to be done. Uh, but having said that, uh, we do have, under, under the Indian law, we do have, uh, we have committees, in-house committees, uh, to deal with sexual harassment cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, the women are actually, if there's a problem, they're encouraged to, to approach those committees, which are absolutely fair. And they are actually members, and they comprise members, uh, they, are the, they are the employees themselves. So, uh, and we do have a system to address to this problem. Mm -hmm. And well, despite that, there are cases of harassment. I, I, I can't deny that. But at the same time, we do have a system of addressing. The issue with having a system of addressing, and if you allow me to push you on this thing, is the same thing as having, having a system um, at CBC for um, making comments about, or having, or having experienced racism, which is that sometimes you don't want to say. Sometimes you don't want to say that something happened, even if you know you're going to be, you know, that you will be listened to, because you're afraid. And that's another reason why I bring up the point about not allowing comments and jokes even in our conversations is because it has to start somewhere. And so um, I think another thing that we have to do is in our newsrooms is support each other. Um, I think in journalism it can be very competitive. And at schools sometimes you're taught, it's taught to, in, in many schools you're taught the competitive nature. Um, if you were in my class you would hear me say, that's not my thing. That's not my thing. My thing is that we are all doing stories. And if you want to do a story really well, I'm not going to be jealous of you. I'm going to ask you, how do you do that? So um, to get back to my point, I really, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it here after I say this, but I think it's very important for us to recognize that sexual harassment exists and that it should not be tolerated. It should not be tolerated at the lowest level so that it doesn't come to the highest level. Yes, those mechanisms should exist, and I'm glad that they exist, that there is a place for you to go. But there is work outside of that that needs to be done. No, I agree with that. Yeah. There's so many you know, the underlining in insinuations and the yeah. which have to be tackled. Yeah, yeah. that is true. Um, that is, would you like to say anything else? Something which is really important yes, to well, share with the audience? I'll say one thing. Um, in, in, we're talking about how inclusive newsrooms foster stronger reporting. And um, ultimately, the bottom line is that the more perspectives we have in our newsroom, the better we can represent the people we serve. That's it. That's really it. Something that I talk about in our classes is, um, is about how those of us who occupy spaces in uh, marginalized communities, we actually have expertise. We actually have expertise. Instead of me going into a newsroom and thinking that I shouldn't tell a story or that I shouldn't pitch a story that has to do with a black community in, in Toronto, I should rather think, hey, I have that expertise. If there's nobody else in this room who is black, 
then who's the expert? It's me. It's me. So if I can tell you what's happening in the newsroom as an editor, you should say, okay, tell me more. Instead of saying what happens a lot, instead of saying you're biased or you're an activist, that kind of thing. Rather, just listen to the folks who have ideas and pitches from their communities. They know what's going on. It doesn't mean you have to do away with the rigor. It doesn't mean that you have to do away with how we, how we do journalism in terms of being accurate and having facts and doing things properly. You don't do away with that. You just say to the person, tell me more. So what, the one thing I would love for you to take away is that, especially if you are a woman or if you are a non-binary person or if you're, part, um, if you're part of a group that is marginalized, underrepresented, not represented, is to understand that you have expertise. So what you will do is you will match your expertise of knowing that community with your expertise of being a journalist. If you put those two together, you have so much to offer to journalism. I'll leave it there. Yeah. Then, uh, but I think I will we'll throw this uh, discussion to the uh, I would like the audience to, uh, to uh, if you want to ask any Yeah, questions. do you have any questions? Any, any one questions? Uh, I'm part of the Weedon Express study. Nice to hear you and nice to hear you. So, um, in the, like we were talking about the women raising issues of sexuality, sexual harassment. Uh, in, uh, in India, we also have the cultural context of stigma attached to um, talking or voicing your uh, concern or, uh, you know, in the cultural context. So tell me, did you also, in your experience, like, if I were to say I was sexually harassed by someone, I would probably be embarrassed about saying it. I, in the sense, I'm just giving an example. And especially young women who yet have to have that confidence to voice their concerns. So as a woman, as a journalist, did you also ever feel that? Did I ever feel, or have I noticed that people don't want to say? Yes, absolutely. Um, you don't want to say that some, something, if you've experienced sexual harassment or sexual assault on the job or around the job, you don't want to say it because you're maybe afraid that people won't believe you. You are ashamed because you feel like maybe you brought it on yourself, right? Um, a lot of people feel shame. They feel like it's their fault, and it's not. It's not. Um, and another thing is that they feel like they, they may not be listened to. Who do you tell first? When do you say it? Um, and I would say that that has happened at, in Canada as well. Um, even if there are mechanisms by which you can report people. Um, but I'm curious more about the, the stigma that you're talking about. Do you mean that um, folks, people who uh, talk about being sexually assaulted or harassed become stigmatized, like they, then they become pariah or whatever it is? Yeah, for having spoken out. Yeah, well, this is why people don't report. So it's like, um, I, I don't know what to say about that, except that you know this is a big culture change we're talking about. Um, oh, sorry, maybe yeah. that's why we need more women bosses. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but not only women bosses, yes, we need more women bosses, <laughs> and we need, we need um, uh, everybody, women bosses, to also create an environment yes. in which it's okay, right? whoever is the boss, right? That's the big thing is that it's about fostering an environment in which people feel comfortable to say what has happened to them. And we, we cannot only start from the work level. This has to begin from schools and colleges. Yes, now we're talking about it and an entire culture change in India. I cannot fix that one, but I'm, I have no problem talking about it. But it's the same thing in, in Canada. We, we, still, we, still have thing, we still have work to do. Yeah, yeah. sure. Anybody else? Uh, good evening, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Rakshika. I am from the journalism. Uh, I am from the journalism department from the Job University. I'm a student there right now. Uh, the context of girl bosses came up, which I think is exceptionally impressive. But keeping that in mind, I wanted to ask: um, when it comes to casual sexism and casual racism in the workplace, especially a close environment like an inclusive newsroom of sorts. 
How does one deal with that when it comes from somebody from your own community and your own community somebody you wouldn't expect it from? Because in a workplace like that you can't afford to ruin the entire working energy of the workplace but you need to deal with it professionally nonetheless. So when it comes from someone you don't expect it from, how do you deal with it then? Do you mean like if I experience racism from another person of color or, yes, okay. Um, it's really hard. This is actually a quiet conversation some of us um, racialized journalists are having. Really, some of us are talking about how um, we have felt uh, mistreatment from other people who are like us in some way. Um, I don't, again, I don't really have an answer for it, but it's really good to bring up. It comes back to, for me, it comes back to the idea of supporting the people that you work with. Um, that when you have a when you come into a newsroom, that the concept of team really has to go beyond just what we are working on together. It's also supporting you as a person. Not that I have to be your therapist or anything, but supporting you as a person in your in your career. So if you come to me and say um, that something has happened to you, I will support you. But also, it means that you know if we share. Uh, if we are both part of, from a certain community, I have to understand that we both are going through the same issues and the same troubles, and so I don't need to hurt you any further. But one thing I will say is that sometimes we learn, um, the, we learn, we learn bad practices sometimes, and some, when we learn these bad practices, I'll, I'll, I'll use management. So if I'm a woman and I have now gotten a new job leading a team and I have only ever been led, uh, the only leaders that I have ever had in a team were men who behaved badly, it's very possible that I may replicate those behaviors no matter who is on my team. So then it might look like to another woman who's on my team, that woman might be going, what are you doing? Why do you, why do you act this way or why are you managing this way? So for that reason, as bad as it may sound, sometimes I give those people some grace just to understand that they are acting the way they know to act. So it's a, it is a tough line that we, that we uh, walk where we're giving people grace because we know that they're only acting how they've been taught to act, but also they need to change. Thank you. Uh, can I just speak on the same thing? I think you basically need to speak up. There's no other way. Because if you don't speak up, that's the first step. Because if we falter at the first step, there's just no help. You have to also help yourself. While seeking help, you also need to help yourself. The first thing is to speak up. Mm. It doesn't matter whether it's expected, unexpected, where it's coming from. The first step is to speak up. Mm. So uh, Nobody can help anybody uh, unless you speak up. That's, that's the first step you have to take. And then, of course, uh, the institution, will, uh, the, the mechanism to address your problem will begin. But I think this, it's I'm hard as it may be, but you have to speak up. That's the only way. Uh, anybody else who would like to? Yeah, please do. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, my name is Umang. I'm a master's student from Chicago School of Mass Communication. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to listen to you. It's, it's wonderful. My question to you is, uh, you mentioned that you started with your, uh, you know, Diversify CBC. So when you started this podcast, what was the initial thought in your mind? Or was it, um, because many people, when they face so much of, you know, Trouble in their workspace, they usually want to make a switch to some other field. And I did. I'll tell you what happened. So the podcast is called Media Girlfriends. Diversify CBC was something else. Diversify CBC was the name of the um, employee resource group. So they're two different things. So when I was in my second mat leave, I had this baby, and all I was doing was changing the baby and feeding the baby and thinking about the baby. And I also thought to myself, what am I doing? What am I doing? As in, what am I doing with my career? I really was thinking that. And I remember thinking, you know, Naba, you, you wanted to interview. You got into journalism and you wanted to interview. At the time, I was hosting a national show. It was a radio show. 
and I was playing music and talking, you know, listen to this song, it's great because this, and here's this trial, all that stuff. But I wanted to interview people. That's why I got into this. That's what I was thinking. And so I thought, how come nobody's like asked me to, to do interviews? Why, why, why am I not getting that opportunity? And the answer that came to me was, well, there's no proof. So creating Media Girlfriends was essentially a way for me to kickstart my career as an interviewer. I knew that I could interview. I knew that I could, but I just, that there was nothing there out there that showed that I could. So I figured that I would create a podcast in which I would interview people and that the people that I interviewed, I would choose my girlfriends because my girlfriends were also hosts and they knew how to interview. So I figured I would interview them and then after the interview, I'd ask them how I did. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, please. Hello, I am Yogi from the School of Communication Studies, Punjab University. Ma'am, we have discussed about how digital journalism is becoming number one. But at the same time, we are facing problems like fake news, plagiarism, and myths. So, what, according to you, is the solution and how to tackle with these kind of situations in digital era of journalism? How to tackle disinformation? You asked me a big question. Am I going to solve it right now? So if I give you the answer, will you all go and do it? <laughs> I think that part of the part of the solution to combating disinformation is learning from a young age, how to discern what is a good source and what is not a good source, right? So if my seven-year-old says to me, if I allowed her to go on the internet and just started to you know, go around and search for things, and she came to me and she said that um, Canada is a city, right? Canada is a country, but if she came to me and said that Canada is a city, I would say to her, where did you learn that information? And then maybe she would tell me. And I would say, what tells, what tells you that this is a place that you should go to that, has, that is accurate? How do you know that this is a source that you should go to for information? So it's really, the, the biggest key is in learning how to tell what is a good source and what is not. And frankly, this is a question that um, some of my students have. I can tell in their, um, in their assignments sometimes when they're trying to prove a point, what they link out to. And I see that this is not a good source. This is not a good source. Why would you th think that this is appropriate? Why, because it says what you want it to say? No. You have to go back and you have to check what this, what this, uh, this source has done, how this source has treated other stories. And that's one of the things that I can say. There are, um, there are experts on disinformation <coughs> online that I, I, would, I, would, I wish I could point you to them, but that's what I'll say for now. Is this disinformation mean uh, uh, planted stories or planted information, or what do you mean by disinformation? There is actually. There's a lot of social media has led to a lot of credibility problems. There's no doubt about that. But I think if you are um, you are rigorously pursuing the social media, uh, there's a pattern. You know, there's a pattern will emerge, and you can always sift the the credible from not so credible. Mm. They, they, your your mind, especially if it's a trained mind of a journalist, your mind will automatically raise questions. Because I think that's one, that's part of our training as journalists. We get a lot of information, not just social media, even from the government. And but immediately you say, oh, why are they pushing the story? You know, something, something is happening. <coughs> so it's also that you can sift, and also a pattern emerges. Hi, Baba. I'm Zena. I'm here to The journey has been quite inspiring. I want to ask you that uh, how have things changed for you uh, since uh, the time that you started journalism? What is the outlook? What is the change in the outlook now when you uh, go to report? And uh, what is the change in the perspective now that we are talking about uh, talk about inclusive inclusivity in the newsroom? So how has it changed? Um, if I answer
answer the question honestly, it's really the biggest change is my own confidence. When you start out as a journalist, you're writing these stories and um, you're a student and you don't know whether you've chosen the right story or you don't know if you've, you've written it well and then you get a job and even then you, in some ways you're trying to please your editor, you are also trying to um, follow your own interests and in the course of doing that, you're not always confident um, and that was what it was like for me. Now, 15, 16 years later, I would say the biggest change is my own confidence. My own confidence. And I'm grateful for that. If I relate it to the issues of inclusivity, it is that I'm now more confident to speak out about um, racism and sexism and, and how it's important for me to speak out about these things. There really was a time when I was too shy, or not even shy, I just thought that people would think that I was, you know, a one-note person, or that I was just always talking about racism or whatever. And now I'm at a place where I just think, well, no one else is doing it. It has to be said. The things have to be said. Um, and I take that back. It's not that no one else is doing it, but it's rather that there are so few of us, and so it's important. She said a very significant thing that she, it's the change in her. I'm very sure when you joined journalism, you must have noticed that change in you because journalism does empower you in a way I don't think many other professions do. It does empower you a lot in the sense that it, it, it empowers you enough to be able to help the disempowered or, or those not empowered. But I think but ultimately that is the achievement after being empowered, if you have been able to empower uh, the, the sections which, which need your help, that is the challenge and that is the biggest achievement. Then. Thank you, Professor uh, Duncan and Ms. Naki Hans for that very insightful and candid conversation. I hope the audience found it useful. On behalf of the High Commission of Canada and the Consulate General of Canada, I would like to thank both the ladies for their time and for uh, their thoughtful conversation. I would also like to thank all the audience uh, uh, for being here today. Uh, but first of all, I would like to thank the Tribune for helping us out with this event and uh, being a partner here in Chandigarh. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the students from uh, Punjab University and Chitkar University and the student coordinators from both these institutions for coming here today and attending the event. <laughs> thank you everybody. Thank you for your time. The Naba, it was such an enlightening evening and I, I look forward to more such meaningful interactions. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.